the seminar is it's, it's the second part of what we started discussing with Indara last week. So he will focus on a drone in state for the search in the top square. So man, most, yeah, many of you probably already know Nick because he worked with us uh, with Jam. Uh, and uh, so actually part of the audience already know him. So he got his PhD in Santa Barbara, and now he's uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, so we will uh, continue the discussion that we, uh, that we started last week. So, yes, we can start. Hello. Okay, I don't know, I haven't seen the session last week, so I don't know how well we continue it, but similar topics. But yes, I'll be talking about um, top scores, uh, specifically in the drawing final state. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, I'm going to do them at the time. Unless if they have to do with the supersymmetric Lagrangian, in which case we can go into it. <laughs> As everyone here probably knows, 2012 was a really big year um, for particle physics. CMS and ATLAS both announced the discovery of the exposon. And this 125 GB particle was really important. It was like the final missing piece for the center model. And as you can would suggest, would guess, uh, the current physics, a big part of the current physics programs for both collaborations is to understand this particle's properties and what impact do these part these properties have on the centered model and new physics beyond the center model. But what I want to talk about today is really just about one property, and that's, and that's its mass. And the reason why is 125 GB is an uncomfortable value. And the reason why is because the Higgs boson is a scalar. It's the only scalar field that we know of. And what this means is that it's extremely sensitive to quantum corrections to its mass. And you can see the formula for the corrections to the uh, mass from a fermion. Here. And um, for the most part, we can really just talk about the top fourth because the, the corrections are proportional to the coupling to the Higgs. And you see right here that we case lambda, which is with basically where we can to say the center model no longer applies. It's the cutoff value. And without any new physics, all we have is the Planck mass, which is 10 to 19 GB. And because the Higgs mass is so much lower than the mass of, or the energy of the physics, um, you have a really weird situation where you have to have a, a number that's 10 to 38, uh, subtracted from another number that's like 10 to 38, that cancels out in so many 10 to the 34 zeros just to get a 10 to the 4 number. And there's nothing technically wrong with that. Um, it's perfectly mathematically fine. It just seems wrong. So there's something missing. And um, so you might ask, how do you, how do you want to solve this? And as a particle physicist, you might be a little selfish, selfish and say, well, I want to be employed, so we have to find new part particles. But um, what uh, something new beyond the Planck scale? Now, the, uh, the standard tool to deal with, with, with this, to, uh, the, the, the standard tool in this, uh, this toolbox is to propose some new symmetry, something that protects the Higgs mass. And it's not just any symmetry, it's a supersymmetry. And it's a symmetry between bosons and fermions. And um, so for every, uh, for every particle in the center model, model there's, a, there's a particle, or degree of freedom, however you want to call it, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, supersymmetric particle. And for example, let's have a top quark, which is a fermion, you have a top squark, which is a scalar. Now, the, uh, these particles have almost the exact same properties except for the spin. Um, but one thing that we do know is that it can't be a perfect symmetry, it must be broken, because um, otherwise we would have already discovered uh, uh, bottom squarks that are 5 GB. Uh, it has to be, they have to have different masses, which is fine. There's mechanisms to um, spontaneously break the, sim break the symmetry without violating it, like the center model. And um, what the result of this is that 125 GB becomes a very comfortable number. Uh, as like the um, that cutoff value, this is the uh, the correction now with um, super, super uh, with supersymmetry, and that that log is now captured in a friendly. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, cutoff is now captured in a local algorithm. And now the important factor is the subtraction of the uh, supersymmetric mass uh, against the, uh, the non supersymmetric mass. And once again, really, really only going to be talking about the third generation, specifically top scores, because it has the most important corrections against the large Kawa company uh, coupling to his. And uh, this is all very subjective. Naturalness is very subjective, and especially it's very model dependent. But a rule of thumb is that as long as the stop the top squawk, I'm sorry, I use both terms interchangeably, um, is around 
below a round of 1 TV, we're fine. Like you, you can accept one out of like 1% or even more finely grained um, um, fractions. Great. But that's, that's not all. That's not all the students can do for you. Uh, it's not all, uh, abnormal to actually impose our parity conservation, which is the conservation of Susan particle numbers, which means that sparks can only be produced in pairs and that the live supersymmetric particle, the LSP, is stable. Uh, which is awesome because that means Susie can naturally provide a dark matter candidate that we can actually produce in applied um, um, collisions. And, um, and there's, other, there's other, of course, other uh, pluses of Susie. And uh, you, this is very simple to, um, rundown, but if you want more information, I have two sources I always go to before I make the slides like this because I always forget everything. So if you want more information, go there. Um, so yeah, so, so Susie can solve almost all of our problems, it sounds like. Um, how do we find that that's a possibility? Well, we have to make the, the particles in, in, uh, we can make the sparkles in a collider and see if we can measure, measure them in the days. So what we use is the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN in, near Geneva. As you can see here on the map, and um, who I'll be talking to you about today is, um, is uh, collisions collected by the CMS experiment. Now, um, this, the LHC has many different types of collisions. We'll be looking at only the proton, proton collisions. And we've been running for a long time, since 2010. Uh, with the, the last really long run was in 2012, where we had 20 petal barns at 8 TV. Last year, we pumped up the energy to 13 TV. But this was uh, not that long of a run. And this year, it's a really long run at the high energy scale. Uh, it's still ongoing, but we have, um, the one I'm going to show you today are the newest results, which are over about 12 petal barns, 13 petal barns of data. Now, um, CMS, for those of you who are, um, aren't uh, aware, I'll do a very, very, very quick and brief overview of it. Its distinguishing feature is the super uh, ducting solenoid magnets, which encases the colorimetry and the tracking systems. And you can see how it's, the CMS is situated. There's the LHC beam, and there's a proton collision. Um, yellow is the after color for proton collisions. Um, right in the center, you can see in this diagram, is the inner silicon tracker, which measures um, charged particle momenta. Um, the blue surrounding that um, spec is the chromatic colorimeter, which is used to ID photons and electrons and also to measure uh, their energy. And around that, in the tannish blob, is uh, the uh, uh, hadron col hadronic colorimeter, which measures the energy of everything else except for muons. And then finally, outside of the magnet is the muon system, which can ID and measure, with, measure muon momentum in conjunction with the inner tracking system. Now, of course, um, just to go very quickly over how collisions happen, we have uh, the, the bunch crossing rate um, in, uh, in the LHC is about 40 megahertz, and most of this, most of this is not very interesting. Uh, so we have a sophisticated triggering system, which is which, which is which reduces what we actually want to take to less than a kilohertz. Um, and one thing to really mention, we mentioned here, that's kind of interesting and it's not being not obvious, is that we have many many protons every collision. So there's actually more than one inelastic collision per event. In fact, there's about 20 extra um, per event, so which we call PILA. And uh, one part of the reconstruction is to actually identify and remove the contribution of PILA from any of our reconstruction observables. Um, CMOS reconstruction is based upon a particle-based reconstruction. And what that means is it uh, uses measurements from all the various subdetectors and combines them down into what we call particles, uh, which have an ID. Uh, what's most likely, what most likely is, or can be associated to, based upon the subdetectors sub that measured it, and also momentum measurements. So of course you can do things like charge left on ID by seeing if there's a track that made a track in the muon, the muon system, it's most likely a muon, and also if there's a track that and also has an ECAL cluster, it's most likely an electron. Um, one thing that we use a lot in the analysis, analysis I'm going to talk to you about today is particle jets. So these are just, we're just clustering together those particles into little groups with an algorithm that's supposed to be um, nearly one-to-one -one or close to what would happen if a particle jet from a single particle. Now, these jets can also be V-tagged, and that's a term used to uh, identify displaced vertices and uh, tracks that have, have um, uh, that result from displaced vertices to tag a jet that it's uh, most likely to come from a heavy flavor decay, which will have displaced vertex. And one of the most important variables we'll be using Today is missing transverse energy. So what you do is you have, is you uh, take the vector sum of all the particles that you measure and look in the transverse plane, 
And uh, if there's anything that's, that's not zero, it's not perfectly balanced, then it's pointing to something that's missing, like uh, a neutrino. And this magnitude is commonly referred to as MS. Uh, so that's CMS in a nutshell. Now for CMS SUSY searches. Um, SUSY, much more than what I showed you a few slides ago, has a very, very large parameter space and many different models and types of particles to look for. Um, and of course, as a result, CMS has a very diverse SUSY program that spans a lot of this parameter space, but also there's a, lot, there's a large uh, overlap between different data analysis looking for the same types of models, which includes looking at the same model but with different lepton channels, as was mentioned, that was talked about last week, but also using different methods and approaches, which is great in the case of discovery. But the, the uh, not a negative, but one takeaway from one, one thing, one result of that is that um, it'd be impossible to adequately go for the CC program in an hour. Um, so instead of a very broad overview of everything, I'll just dive into a single analysis, and then we'll kind of get a bigger picture summary at the end. Like I said before, we'll be looking at only the newest results. These were um, first re announced or released last month at IGF. So um, yeah, it's still, it's still pretty new. So as we figure out what type of SUSE model we want to look for, what type of search we want to go into, we want to bring this back to what we're looking for, which is we're trying to think about the Higgs mass and uh, how can SUSE uh, protect it. So, and also, um, why not try to solve the dark matter problem at the same time? So we're going to look for SUSE that's um, R parity conserving, because we want a dark matter candidate. Um, and one of the consequences of this is a new search we look for will have some type of missing energy in the, uh, the end. And we'll also look at the MSSM, which is the uh, minimal supersymmetric super standard model, which is just the least number of particles necessary to uh, satisfy SUSE. Seems reasonable. Um, now we can decide what type of particles we want to look for. And um, there's a whole plethora, but once again, we're focusing on naturalness, so let's look at the third generation, specifically top sports, so this very strong naturalness bounds. And then you can figure out, well, how do we want to make this particle? Because stocks can be made in multiple different ways. And uh, we want to reduce the number of model assumptions as much as, as we possibly can. It's impossible to completely remove them. But so while the Indirect production through gluinos, the um, supersymmetric partner of the, the gluon, um, has a very large cross section and a very nice final state. You, ha you have to assume that the gluino is accessible. Uh, and that's a small enough mass that we can produce at the collider. Um, another assumption we're not going to make is that uh, the left, the, the, the supersymmetric partners, the left hand and the right hand have top quarks, or have the same mass, so they don't have to have the same mass. Uh, so we're going to assume that only one mass eigenstate to the top support is accessible to us. And then, now, we already have our model figured out what we want to look for. And uh, one more choice we should probably make, um, though it has nothing to do with the system model itself, is what lepton channel we want to go for. Now, even though we're looking for this, the same type of signal, and actually in most of the channels it has the same kind of background composition, you need a completely different optimized search design for each target, each target of the lepton channel. And not only that, the background predict predictions are typically very much different. So it's, it's really nice to focus on just one at a time. Um, well, let's go with the alpha drama. You saw the single lepton last week. Um, it has a one plus and it has this, uh, a larger branching ratio. 46 to 44 doesn't seem that much, but once you factor in the, um, the um, inefficiency of actually identifying leptons, so you can't ident identify every lepton, uh, it's actually a little bit larger, but yeah. So we're going to look for all the hadronic stops. Now, uh, what about how does that stop decay after you produce it? Now, how we do this in CMS is that we, in, and also have this too, that we interpret the stop decays in simplified models, or SMS. And what this does is instead of having a very full SUSE model that we try to test, what we do is we focus on a few final states that then can be mapped onto a, um, a um, specific SUSE model in the end. For example, if you have two final states and you say, uh, my SUSE model would have 25% of one, 25% of the other, you can take your acceptances to each final state and map it to your SUSE model in the end. And furthermore, we have two broad categories of these, uh, of these decay modes. And it's based upon the mass splitting between the uh, top squirt and the LSP, which in our case is the uh, lattice microlina. And as, as you can imagine, as you get more and more compression, your, your decay characteristics are different. 
Um, and of course, we further parameterize our signal model based upon the masses of these two particles. Um, we're going to focus on the large mass loading category um, and then quickly come back to the, 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 uh, the more compressed uh, category. Because the, uh, and the reason why is that the only difference in the search design, the background estimation methods are nearly identical. So we can just, for, for simplicity, come back to it. Now um, I have the, uh, the preliminary result you can look at later if you want some more information. Um, so here, you just Google it. Um, so yeah, so for the large mass splitting, we can compare two types of decay modes for the top scores. One is through the top decay, where the stop decays to a top in, it, in the neutrino. And the other is the charging node decay, where it decays to a a B port charging node, which then subsequently decays through a W boson and a neutral node. And uh, as you can imagine, these are definitely not exclusive. We, we interpret it as 100% branching ratio to one or the other, but you can have mixed branching ratios. But instead of adding much more complexity, you, this is actually, it's good enough for us to just consider one or the other, because we typically have better sensitivity to this guy, so, and less to this one, so if it was a mixed branching ratio, it's somewhere in between these two results. And they actually have a very similar final states. The only little difference is the, um, is the top. So to start building our search, what we're going to do is look at some general signal properties so that, so that we can build a, um, a simple baseline analysis. That way we can preserve signal efficiency while getting rid of most of the center model background. And after that, we can see where we are and how we're going to move from there. So here is um, exploded stop decay, where you can, you can look at. Um, one of the most important characteristics, as I've said before, is that there's missing energy from two LSPs. And this is one of the most important discriminators, discriminators we have in the center model. And in fact, this is how we actually re record the events that we visually analyze. We ask for online figure events. And for all these cuts, I have the, uh, the, cut, I have the actual selection down here, but it's not really, the actual numbers don't matter too much, it's more what they are. And what's actually quite important is what this missi missing energy is not. This missing energy is not caused from the typical sources that we see in the center model. For example, a W decaying electronically. So what we can do is that we can um, identify isolated electrons or muons in the events and veto those events because they're, they're likely to, to come from a TD bar decay or a W plus jets. Nor are they caused by tau leptons from a W decay that then decay hydronically. So what we do for that is that we reject events with isolated charged, um, charged particles. And um, this is much harder to do than the, than the um, in the case of electrons and muons, because we don't have the good particle ID. But we do have some tricks to kind of help reduce this background. For example, we uh, require that the transverse mass, which the formula is here, uh, be consistent with the WDK. And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the transverse mass, but if, the, uh, if you had two objects, in this case met, and um, the charged particle, come from the same parent particle, and if the parent particle was fully transverse to the beam, the transverse mass would be at the mass of that particle. As it gets more longitudinal boost, it will be closer to closer to zero. So what you do is you have a cutoff at the, uh, at the parent particle's mass. And finally, um, the MET we see from SUSY is not from jet mismeasurement, but just jet mismeasurement. So we can do different ty types of tricks to reduce this background. But for example, the obvious, of course, is noise thing, which we always do. But also one thing that we do is we reject events where the MET is lined with one of the leading jets in the event, which is typical of uh, multi-jet events where you have really uh, severe jet misemissions. So what else do we have? That's the MET. We also have six quarks uh, that, can, that can actually produce jets. And um, actually just requiring five jets um, really suppresses um, Z plus jets and W plus jets events because it's harder and harder to produce an extra, extra quark. Um, furthermore, two of these are B quarks, which we can select on and even further suppress the Z and W events. And um, as I mentioned before, we can select B, um, B like jets by looking at if there's a presence of displaced vertices. And we have two working points that we, that we use here of this, um, of this um, tagging algorithm. One is a loose, a loose working point, for, which has about 80% efficiency, and we will require two of those objects. And then we have one that's slightly tighter at least 60%. We require one of those to be a little bit more signal to, to, have, to suppress the background a little bit better. Okay. So that's kind of our baseline, how we're, we're going to start off from. And this is our background composition. The most important background is the lost lepton, where we have a uh, W decaying two leptons from either T D bar or W plus jet events, or a single top two. 
uh, where the we just don't identify the charge lepton. Either it's too low on PT or it's just not isolated. We can't uh, we can't uh, pick it out pick it out in the background. Following by that, we have Z plus jets events where the Z begins um, invisibly. Even though we have all these hadronic requirements of jets and B tags, Z likes to make lots and lots of mets, so um, it has a large cross section, so we still get it. And finally, well, not finally. We have QCD, which is about 5%, which is just multi-jet events that have large net from severe jet measurement that does not uh, fail it, does not uh, pass any of the cuts from previous dimension, or heavy flavor decay. And then finally, finally, we have our rare, uh, our rare backgrounds, which is about 2%, which is predominantly um, TD bar Z, so um, TD bar with the associated production that Z goes on. And um, this gets small but still interesting because when the TD bar decays hydronically and Z Invisibly, it's an irreducible, back, irreducible background. It looks just like a signal. So where does that leave us? After the baseline selection um, on this data set, we have around 6,000 background events. So actually, compared to what we started out with, it's not that bad, you can guess. Um, but looking at one moderately high mass signal event, 800 GB stop, um, 100 GB LSP, we have about 60 signal events. So we actually have quite a bit of work to do. So we go from here, it's from this baseline, you start to have stricter and stricter selections, so you can at least kill off this background. But one, one approach that we take here is that instead of having a single very strict selection, what we do is we divide the sample up into subsections that have a gradient of S for B that we then uh, interpret on. And um, this has two effects. One is that you don't actually throw away signal, you still use it if it's a moderately useful search region. But also you can Different signals have different characteristics, right? One might have really hard jets, but low mets. So that way you can have, you can target all the different types of signals that we're looking for at the same time. So I'm gonna go over how we categorize these events now. One of the uh, most important variables we use is what we call MTB, which is, comes from the idea that in TT bar, which is one of our most important backgrounds, the, the W decays leptonically, we have one W that decays leptonically. And if you can figure out what where that B is, and you have your and, and, and you have your net for the W, the transverse mass should be peaked at the at the top mass, as Robert mentioned before. Now the, and the problem is though we have two B-like jets in our bank, and we require at least two B tags. So what we do is we take the minimum empty uh, MT value between those two, which we call the MTB. And what this just guarantees that we do have the cutoff at the um, at the top mass. And this is great for signal, because you can see here for a nice uh, signal with large, large mass splitting is that signal that does not have this restraint. That there's no, um, that it's just two random LSPs that produce the MET, so it's very broad. But we do want to keep the less than 175 GB, even though all the background, most of the background is here, because you can see here for a signal with low mass splitting, where there's low intrinsic MET, uh, most of this populated down here too. So we can then work on this population independently. Um, we can also use top and W uh, uh, reconstruction. And the idea is that signal events have boosted tops and W decays in them, hadronic tops and W decays. And then if we can identify them and tag them, then we can really suppress background, especially in Z plus jets and W plus jets. But also TD bar, so remember, TD bar is not, even though it does have one hadronic uh, top in there, it's not as boosted as signal, and also it's only one, signal has two. So you can use it as a, as a um, so when you have a boosted object that decays, it's usually collimated, right? It's boosted. So we do this by first reclustering all the particles in the event into larger, what we call fat jets. And the idea is into one fat jet, they collect all the decays of the boosted, all the decay of the boosted object. Um, and then we do some grooming to remove soft radiation, so it's a cleaner sample, so a cleaner, a cleaner jet. So it is very great to get these points. And then you can see here for the groomed fat jet mass in TT and in TT bar, and then in this in this in this uh, top it's QCD. And you see you have two peaks. One is where you have a collimated top, and one where you have a collimated W. Uh, and if you want more, there's this uh, CMS released this two years ago, maybe one year, of this uh, from this uh, NASA summary, where you can read all about this and other techniques. So it's really useful. Um, but that's not all we can do, not just, just the mass and our only handle. We can also look for a substructure, because remember, this boosted object decayed into three quarks, it's the top. And if you can 
to label that, say, oh, this looks like it came from three quarks, you can have further signal, signal suppression versus just a gluon jet, which is just the mesh, the mesh of energy. So a variable we use for that is called n uh, It's uh, which just measures the jet substructure. And uh, n has, uh, depends on, the, there's tau one, two, three to infinity, where tau one means you're looking to see how compatible your jet is with as with coming from one single cluster of energy, one to one energy deposit. Or tau two is equal to two, three is three. And the smaller tau values, the uh, the more the more compatible you are. And I have the formula here, right? and in the paper I said it has more information, but that's just the general idea. And uh, what we use is the ratio. We use the ratio of hypothesis hypotheses. So that we for top of case we check for a small tau three over tau two, and for W case a small two over tau one. And I have the epic cuts here, if you're curious, but we're looking for generally about 200 GV objects, and then W case, and top case, 400 GV. And we divide our sample up into four different categories. Um, of course, in, in the case of no types of reviews, if you couldn't find anything, because once again, we do want to keep our signal efficiency. <coughs> but also in the case of one, no tops, one W, one top, no Ws, and one each. And I'll just quickly go over this, because of course we check everything in signal and data. I mean, simulation and data to make sure we can model and understand it properly. But this is rather important because it's um, one of the most powerful ways that we can suppress signal, so we should be extra uh, uh, cautious about this, about, this, um, about this variable. So this is the tagging efficiency in TTPAR compared to data simulation, and here is the QC, uh, the fake rate as measured in QC. And in general, the, uh, they, they agree uh, relatively well. There's a small correction for the, uh, the most tag rate. And uh, we, of course, apply them when they're heated, use crushing the simulation. But in general, the, uh, the data and simulation agree part of well. So furthermore, we, then we have a few more different types of categorization. We, we break up the, the, uh, the signal into one or two big tags, once again, to increase signal efficiency. I'm sorry, to increase uh, our significance, but then the expense of efficiency. We break up the event into the number of jets, in the case of where we can't really reconstruct the top. It's useful for that. And then finally, we force divide the sample up into net bits. And this is great because it gives you a nice gradient of S over higher net, more more S, more more S, uh, well, more S over less S. And here they are. We have six, 60 independent search regions. Um, I put this up here because I wanted to use lots of colors on one slide, but you don't need to look at them all. Um, the idea is that we then we use all 60 together, where we do a, a bin likelihood fit over all 60 when we, when we, uh, when we uh, analyze the results. So we actually use information from every single piece of this, of this region, which is nice. Now, the one draw, drawback of that is that you need to have precise modeling and assignment model background in this very complex parameter space. Uh, and so to do that, we utilize data different background predictions that are, that are defined by these data control regions, which are, very, which are thematics, thematically similar to the search regions that we're trying to so I'll briefly go over that right now. So like I said before, Lost Lepton is the largest background at 73%. And uh, the data control sample we use is, select, is one selected electron our muon. So the idea is that we have, the, we have our search region, but instead of between the lepton, we ask for one. And the idea is that the, our search region is, in our search region, the population is uh, single lepton events where we, where we can't isolate the lepton, and then our control region is where we were able to isolate it. So the rest of the event is actually pretty similar, so it's actually very, very close to our search region, this control region. Um, but then we can apply the full chromatic um, cuts from our, our every single search region and get a one-to-one -one control region to search region, with actually slightly more statistics than the search region. And this shows you the net distribution for one, for one such chromatic. In the, uh, when we do the prediction, as so it's very simple. The number of predicted events is equal to the number of events in our single lepton control region times the ratio of single, le uh, single lepton to zero lepton in Monte Carlo. So what we do is we allow Monte Carlo to actually handle all of the uh, lepton selection efficiency problems, or to model the lepton, sorry, to model the lepton selection efficiency for us. Otherwise, it's very simple. And of course, um, our main systematic is uh, our control region statistics. We only get about a factor of two increase with respect to our search region. And, but of course, we also uh, evaluate systematics on that, um, that Monte Carlo ratio to make sure that we can trust it well enough, or at least to 
put uncertainty on how it will be trusted. Z plus just is slightly more complicated. And the reason why is uh, we have to use two data control samples. And in fact, uh, we use simulation to predict the search region. But with these data control samples, we, we, uh, we correct the simulation. And we do that for two different ways. First is we use the, the Z plus Jets events for the Z in case to two charge leptons, the very leptons are the ones. And the idea is that if the Z decays to neutrinos or to neurons, it's the exact same kind of event, right? It's a very, very one-to-one -one process. So you can use it directly to, to predict your search region. The negative of that is, of course, the cross-section of the two charged leptons that you can tag and to, to neutrinos. You have like a factor of three more statistics in the, in the, in the search region than the control region. So we, so we can't actually go deep into our are very, very tight cuts with this, with this, with this data control samples. So instead what we do is we measure a, a normalization correction to the simulation in our, in our baseline, in a, in a region similar to our baseline selection. So we can measure the uh, correction to our one B tag and right in the two B tags uh, regions after large uh, boson PT and also multiple jets. And overall, the, the normalization, normalization corrections are, are actually, they are what they are about 15% um, uncertainty. So that's how we can get our normalization in the Monte Carlo. Well, how about the, um, the modeling of the rest of the event, you know, the top tagging efficiency? For that, we use photon plus jets. And the idea is that at high boson PT, and by high, I mean we're looking at over 250 GeV bosons, photon plus jets events and C plus jet events are very much equivalent. They're, they're very, very similar. So from there, we can actually use the photon plus jets to, on top of that, measure the the, the final the modeling of the uh, of the boson PT spectrum from 250 GeV to 600 GeV, the the number the the top tagging rate, etc. And uh, this is how we put all the, these two pieces of information together. The prediction is equal to the centering is equal to just the Monte Carlo the search region times a a, a, Monte, a, a data from Monte Carlo uh, correction measured in the the data dialect region for normalization, and then a data over Monte Carlo correction from the proton plus jets control region. So once again, it's not too much complicated, it's not too much more complicated, but it is slightly more complicated. Uh, of course, uh, well, once again, it's not of course, but once again, the main systematics are controlling statistics, uh, quite hard, but, uh, but then we, uh, we also evaluate uh, systematics on this translation, translation between gamma plus jets to Now, to, now, one slide on, on the not so important backgrounds. 5% QCD, we do a very similar thing to the other backgrounds, is that we use the data control region. In this case, as I said before, the, uh, the veto events where the, uh, in, the, in our actual search, the veto events where MET is aligned from the leading jets because this is typical of QCD. Well, if we invert that and require MET to, uh, MET to be aligned with the leading jets, then we have a QCD enhanced region, as you see here. And then we can, once again, use simulation to translate these yields, the data control region yields to the search region. And then finally, for the rare processes, which is pretty much just TTZ, we estimate them directly with simulation. And of course, this means that we have to have evaluate more simulation specific uncertainties like the PDF, cross section, etc. <coughs> okay, so that's how we that's how we predict the backgrounds. Um, one thing that you might want to add, one thing that we like to do is that even though these I feel that these, these, these seem reasonable back predictions. You want to have some type of, some way to verify that they work before you jump into your search region. So what we do is we have what we call validation regions. These are regions that are close, to, similar to our search region, but it's not, not very high signal contamination. So it's not, it can't be actually used for a search region, and also it's independent from all these other control regions I discussed. Just so we can test out the, the methods. And so that's what we do here. We, we um, remember our search region cuts is met 250 GV. So what we do is we look at a slightly lower 200 to 250 GV in that region, and then we evaluate all of our search regions. For example, this is one top and one depth, and we just test on the methods just to verify that everything works. Um, and it does. We're, we're quite happy with it. And so it gives us some confidence before trying to do the search regions that these methods are reasonable. And I'm not going to go over it with you all these different uh, search regions because um, that would take, it's kind of boring because it's just a bunch of plots like this. Um, 
this is uh, one example where you see these are different net ranges. This is for 1w, 1 top, and 1w and 1 top, where you see our type of search engine right here. Uh, but overall, we have good agreement between data, data and prediction. We have some slight tension, like very, very mi minor tension in some of the high net regions, but it's nothing to write home about, nothing significant. Um, so what we do is we just interpret this as a limit on top score. It's a cross section. Which I'm showing you right here. So this is the decay where uh, the stop decays to a top in the neutralium. And let me explain this plot to you because there's a more like this. Um, and the x-axis is the uh, top squirt mass, and the y-axis is the LSP mass. So every point is basically one specific model. So a SUSE model where you have a 600 GB stop and a 200 GB LSP. And um, the color gradient is the uh, is the upper limit, 95% upper limit on the cross section. And the dotted line is the uh, is the is the region shows you the region where we can exclude it, where below within it, the 90% confidence level we exclude we exclude these models. The dotted line the, 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 the dotted line is the expected what we expect just from our Monte Carlo accounts, and the black the black line is what we observed based upon our uh, the actual data. Now, like I said before, there's some slight tension, nothing significant, so that's why you come in the um, high nets, uh, top tagged region, so that's why you see that the expected and observed limits um, don't, um, or about one sigma difference over here. But um, this is, um, um, we're, we're pretty happy with this result. It's, uh, we are at 900 PG stops, which is uh, much stronger than any of the previous results. At ATV or even the Last year, in 2015 run, we got to about 800 GB, so this is actually a large increase in sensitivity. Can you go back to the one more mm -hmm. and show us which bins, one more back and show yeah. us which bins have the small accesses? We have this one and this one, and if there's one more, this is just, this is the 2B tag, so there's one more 1B tag in the same bin. So it's just like one or two events, but it's nothing significant, just. A couple of bins at one signal. Yeah. Gives you this thing that's mm -hmm. a little bit more than one sigma. Yeah. It's cute, but. Yeah. What's yeah. the uncertainty come from there? The yeah, uncertainty on the uh, limit? No, the biggest uncertainty is in those bins that have the data, the data control regions. Data. I mean, this, this up here is it's still mostly Z, but it's mostly um, Z. So it's just the photon control region and also the, a uh, little bit also the fossil uh, plot control region. Uh, Z is a bigger background than last time out there? At high met, maybe not in this one because you're asking for a W at a top, so maybe then it's still a T bar. But as you go into higher and higher events, it becomes more and more important. Yeah, it's nothing significant, but it just happens to be on the same uh, region where the, where the signal is sensitive to. And so that's why you actually don't see it here, right? So this is um, also this is in the charging no case where we have no gain from the top tagging, so that's why. The, Expectation and the observation are very much one on one. Okay, so that was our dive into the high mass splitting uh, region. Um, now, for a very brief overview of the low mass splitting. Now, this is the case where the stop and the LSP are so compressed that neither uh, you can't produce on shell top score values. There's not an amount of out. So, what you have are these four body decays, essentially. With LSP and your uh, three quarks. Now the background composition is very similar to that of the uh, the high mass region, and this search estimation strategy is nearly identical. So we're not going to go over that. We're just going to look over how we design the, uh, how the uh, the search search regions were designed differently. And here's another diagram for you. Uh, this is now for the four body decay, and if, it, if it's just a case by itself, these 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 events aren't very interesting, right? They're just some soft quarks, right? So not, not, not too much going on. But you can make them interesting if you had an ISR jet, some initial state radiation that boosts the system. The reason why this makes this interesting is because these LSPs typically have some mass, not zero LSP. So they carry a lot more momentum than the, uh, the, the linearly massless quarks. So what you see is you have a different characteristic than, in a, than you would have in some model event where you have an initial state radiation. And the search regions are based upon, based upon understanding this, um, by our, the categorization of the search regions is based upon the yeah, properties of this ISR jet. We label a jet as most likely coming from ISR. And also the, um, the decay force. For example, we require that the, that the B force actually lower PT 
because in this case the big force of work contained the next kind of model, which is kind of might seem out counterintuitive to you at first. Um, and here is the result. Now this is the same same type of plot as we showed before, except for this is this little squiggle is way above the other squiggles you saw previously. And you um, and um, once again we did a good expectation, so we we got discovery stops. Um, but the sensitivity of the search was actually quite um, quite logical enough than in, than in the past. So for example, in the past we can only be sensitive to 320 G house scores, but now we're up to 420 G. So this was this type of we All right, so that's my little run into this search. Uh, now let's look at how this fits in with the rest of the CMS SUSE program. I was saying this is very brief examples. Don't take it as complete, but it's not. Not even trying to be. Um, so I said before we have lots of CMS has lots of searches that interpret this model because it's a, these um, top scores are interesting signal. In fact, here you see all of them right now. Um, and here's this line is the one that uh, I just discussed with you. And just to let you know uh, what these mean, the dotted lines is the expected limit, and the solid lines are the uh, observed limits. Uh, one I want to highlight with you is the one that Dara talked about last week, which is the search the same for the same type of signal, but in a single left channel. And that's uh, this guy right here. And what's really cool is that these two searches have completely independent search regions, so you can actually combine them for much more stronger results, which has been done. It's the black line you see here. Or you see this is the observed, and this is the uh, expected. And this is actually, I find this quite exciting because we're finally starting to become sensitive to the one TV top scores in some some, some, some scenarios. So we're actually being able to start going at the balance of naturalness in some cases. It's fun. But that's not all CMS has. Um, of course, we look for all kinds of different types of CZ. Uh, one very brief example is like C4. You can make top scores through indirectly through Lumino decay if you can at least produce the Lumino uh, in collisions. And uh, because of the large cross section and also because of the, the amazing final state of having four top forks, and <coughs> no problem with that, um, you can have real sensitive to much much higher uh, mass objects. We have, remember this now in this case it's, this is the Lumino mass object. But the top score maps. And this model top score is assumed to be inaccessible, so it's, it's virtual. Um, but you're, you're up to almost 1.8 TV and Lumino, so that's quite nice. And of course, we also have many different searches looking for this signal. Um, so yeah, so we haven't found this yet, uh, but uh, but it's not nothing to be sad about because uh, the 2016 run is really still ongoing. I mean. The research, the results I showed you about searching just now are about this much data. Right now, we're at this much data, or twice as much, and they, and they run is still ongoing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it should be much more interesting than the up. Especially when you, when you when I come back to this, is that we're actually finally starting to start to test the natural top score. And this next analysis on the rest of the data set should be quite fun to look at. That's it. I mean, the not all of them, right? Because it's a pretty small oh, well, line. Oh, when the Gluino plot, especially, it looked like they were really systematic. Maybe, maybe a little bit, but no, I wouldn't really bring anything into it. I mean, you also have to realize that a lot of these searches probably do have overlapping regions too, like um, the MP2 and the RA2. Sorry, which <laughs> uh, gets missing energy do have overlap, so I'll bring anything into it. sample to measure your Z background. How do you set uncertainties on photon to Z production ratios and kinematic ratios? Well, one thing that we do is, I didn't go into this in the talk, is that we don't use photons to directly predict Z, because that's when it starts to get a little fuzzy. What we do is we use the we use the photons to predict differences between data and Monte Carlo, right? We use it to get a correction. So, what, so we don't have to prove that photons can make Z's, so we have to prove is that they have the same data Monte Carlo consistencies. 
which we, we checked uh, in, in more inclusive search regions, more inclusive regions such as this, where uh, this is the, uh, what we like to call is the uh, double, well, the blue, the blue line is in Pocahontas Jets, and this is in lots of Jets and one thing tab, data from Monte Carlo, and then the uh, colored line, I assume this is red, um, is the same in Z plus Jets events. So this is data versus Monte Carlo in both cases. And this right here is what we're trying to test for, is that the data market over Monte Carlo ratio is the same in the two processes, which we find is true. And we do apply a um, systematic map up to 17%. So what's, the, what's the uncertainty based on? You do it based on the statistics of the red curve there? This is done from the statistics and the, uh, the scatter of, the, of this recovery ratio. Isn't that just the statistics of the Z control sample? It is limited by that, yes. Yes. So how do you gain? I mean, the, the gain comes from having photon events that have more statistics, right? So if you end up setting limits, uncertainties based on the Z, where are you winning? Well, because we don't do it in the, the right in the because we make the hypothesis that we, we, we postulate that they are the same, right? And we look at more inclusive regions to verify that that's the case. It's all this double ratio is flat statistically in all cases in all the more inclusive regions. So in a more inclusive region, we measure the systematic. We don't actually go into top tagging with two B tags, because then you would, you're right, you wouldn't gain anything. So you take a one-dimensional projection yes. and, and, mm -hmm. and we look into the other variables too to verify that that's reasonable and it is. So one more question. So when you check your event estimation in the other control region, mm -hmm. so this here, one main control region and then another one that was checked, right? mm -hmm. do you expect some systematic from this? Yeah. So, so it's just the validation. It's just just a sentiment check to make sure that's before we open up the box, before we right. look into the search region. So you don't get any systematic from no. the right from the no. Another question? But no, we can thanks the speaker. Right. And then we also get a copy and then so we'll turn out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll put a 